to rotate from the road. Yeah, so I'm getting a lot. Yeah. Um, so I asked them to go up place somebody I think. So we're on the second half of section 11 where we're talking about damages and the rule we're supposed to look at this week is rule 51 which is instructions to the jury. So let's talk a little bit about uh, civil procedure rule 51 uh, quickly. Uh, the reason jury instructions become so important is it's the law that ultimately the jury will use in resolving the controversy. And they also happen to be the very last thing the jury hears uh, prior to going out and deliberating. After closing arguments, the jury is instructed on what the law is uh, that they should apply in finding the facts. Uh, lawyers submit proposed instructions to the jury in jury trials. Uh, obviously, the, to the extent that you get what I refer to as your jury instruction versus uh, the other side's jury instruction, it makes it potentially much easier for you to win than, than, than your adversary, and that is our goal as the advocate. Uh, you know, e even a simple instruction in most cases with respect to what the preponderance of the evidence means, and we really shouldn't have a disagreement about that, it means simply to tip the scales ever so slightly in your favor that what you're saying is more likely true than, than not true. Um, but when you describe preponderance of the evidence, there are um, a few different instructions. And I, I like to use when we're, if we were defending the case, uh, you sometimes hear language about the plaintiff must prove their case by the fair preponderance of the evidence. Well, I don't know, you know, that, that's kind of an abstract notion, but I'm not sure what it means. Um, but when we add the fair preponderance, maybe that means it sounds greater than it is, because at the end of the day, what, what's needed is the same. The point is, what you want to do when you're trying your civil cases is find the instructions that make it easiest for your client to succeed, and you need to think about what those instructions are going to be through the course of the discovery in the case and obviously ultimately at the trial as you present your evidence. Um, oftentimes, the court will request proposed jury instructions prior to the start of the case. And what they're asking you for is, will you submit to us what you would see as the proposed jury instructions? If I submit them and you don't, um, then the fact is the court's more likely to take mine than yours because you didn't submit anything. Um, the fact is you should know and you should have what the instructions are or you shouldn't be trying that case. Um, and at the end of the day, your case that you put on should reflect a great deal of thought and attention to what the law is and what the jury is going to be instructed on what the law is at the close of the case. Um, and so the best practice is that the court will request parties to submit proposed jury instructions uh, prior to the start of the case, and then we'll look at them, and then at some point there'll be what we call a charging conference. And the charging conference simply means a discussion among the attorneys in the court, the judge, as to what instructions the court proposes to give, what instructions of yours that you propose that the court will not give, and uh, to try and have, to a large extent, perhaps an agreement on what the instructions should be. But the fact is, this is a really important point where you, uh, point of the proceedings where you have to hold your ground and make sure that the jury is properly instructed, instructed such that it's beneficial to you. If you at the end of the day say, yeah, you're under those instructions are fine, then the fact is you have likely lost any challenge on appeal with respect to the validity of the instructions. Um, sometimes there won't be a charging conference per se, but that the court will call the counsel up um, and say, okay, I've, I'm going to give the instructions um, and, and then, then proceeds to give them and then calls counsel up again to say, anyone have any problems with what I've said? And, you know, there's a crunch here where the court wants to give the jury the, the, the case. You want to get some feedback from the jury, hopefully successful feedback, but this is not the opportunity to be a nice guy or girl um, or to you know, be, be concerned about people's feelings or, geez, it's kind of late in the day, let's uh, just keep this moving, because if you don't object to instructions that are given that you think are erroneous, you have lost 
your rights to object to those instructions later on. This is the time where you have to be uh, vocal about the instructions you want to give and to the extent the other side is not uh, objecting to my instructions, there's really no reason for the court not to give those instructions because uh, what it means is that I'll have a right of appeal as long as I protect my record during this uh, jury instruction process. Uh, if you went downstairs, there are various books in the library on proposed jury instructions, oftentimes on relatively common cases. Proposed jury instructions on driving under the influence cases. Some of you may have uh, an interest in looking at those. Um, proposed jury instructions on assault battery cases. I mean, there are instruction books, where, and, and all that is are sample instructions taken from cases or uh, and, 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 and what the law is as to what constitutes a homicide, what constitutes negligence, what constitutes whatever that area of law is which you have some familiarity with now, but the precision of the language becomes important um, and whether you're going to be more likely successful or less. And, and frankly, there's an instruction that favors the plaintiff, there's an instruction that favors the defendant on, as you might guess, virtually any area of the law. So, I mean, I, I look from time to time, and I've been a lawyer, long time now, I look from time to time on a reasonable doubt instruction and there's probably, there's at least 10 I regularly come across and even still I have to go look it up and go look them up at this point and say well which is the better one and again depends on whether I'm defending or whether I'm prosecuting if, if I'm looking at that instruction and so if there are that many then then you have a number to pick from um, and a number to insist on with respect to what you want the court to instruct on what reasonable doubt means. And if, if I gave you a test today and a quiz and asked you to write me out an instruction on reasonable doubt, the likelihood is not one of us in the room, including myself, would get to the standpoint where it's sufficiently correct that it might not still be reversible on appeal. And I think I, got a, I could give you a pretty good one at this point, but without seeing it and looking at it, um, um, the likelihood of getting it correct the way I think it should be is, is low. And your likelihood of getting that correct is probably significantly lower. I'm just simply trying to make the point is that this is an area that is not as nearly precise as we might like. And so this is a chance to be really a strong, forceful, well-educated advocate, because this is the this is going to potentially this is by far the 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 opportunity to win or lose your case. Um, and sometimes I don't think we you always pay sufficient attention to it because let's just get done. Let's just be finished. And that's, you just can't look at that. The charging conference, the final pretrial conference where we talk about the charge and we talk about the questions submitted to the jury, I can leave those conferences and know whether I'm much more likely to win or lose. And, and conversely, depending on what happens during those conferences, I know whether I can hold my hand tight or whether I should be thinking to a greater extent I've got to settle. And, and that's simply, if you think about it, it's based on what questions are going to be submitted to the jury and what the court is going to instruct them on what the law is with respect to any of the, the various legal issues that are involved. Um, so it becomes a, a fundamentally important thing. And think about some of these damage issues that were sort of floated around and are, trying, are struggling with. Think of how many variations there probably are as to what the appropriate measure of damages are simply for pain and suffering. Right? If we looked at instructions on pain and suffering and what's compensable, you're going to find a variety of um, information there, even on the information about uh, proof of damages, if you think of that topic. Um, and if you're the plaintiff, obviously, you want that broad, vague language that, you know, the, the, the plaintiff doesn't have to prove damages to a certainty. That's not the standard. The standard is only more likely than not of the plaintiff's calculation of damages. 
um, likely true as opposed to not being true. I mean, there's a million different things we look at as we get closer to that with respect to jury instructions. Uh, but it's a, it's, it, it's a vital time to be vigilant and contrary to some of our nature to be uh, obstreperous if that's what it takes to make sure the court gives our instructions. And sometimes that's not easy for everyone. For a big jerk like me, it's easier, right? My guess, but this is your opportunity, you've got to do it too. And go ahead. My question is, um, do they, do you as the attorneys, I mean, I know you can propose the questions, but do you know for sure when what questions are going to be asked prior to him giving the instruction, prior to the judge, or what? They, they would, yes, that would normally be part of the same process. The jury interrogatories or the jury verdict form would also be generally addressed during the final charging conference or the final pretrial conference. So I would have an understanding, should have an understanding. By the way, that's not this week's lesson, but jury interrogatories or special verdict form, that has to tie directly to your instructions to the jury. Right? There's no sense thinking about them as distinct pieces because the jury instructions hopefully are going to address how they're going to be answering either the special verdict form or the jury interrogatories or even the verdict form. Um, and, and that has to tie together. And so I need to know which, you know, which exactly what they're, what they're going to say. The problem is in some cases that this is all oral, right? Think about it from the standpoint of the poor jury. They're getting these instructions verbally. They, on many judges still don't let them take notes. And so sometimes the charge will be fairly lengthy and we expect them to remember it all. You know, you guys get to take notes. Uh, think of what that must be like for lay people. And, and, and so that becomes part of the problem as well. That's why I like a more detailed jury set of jury interrogatories so that we can walk them through those steps. And so again, I see that as part of this process, but I need to know what the court's going to instruct on. And in some cases, all of that will be, you know, the court, the court will simply start their charge without, without having addressed it again with you issue their charge to the jury, which could last for anywhere from, say, 20 minutes to an hour and a half, call the lawyers up to sidebar and say, okay, anyone got any problems with what I said? Um, and you may have a whole bunch. Um, and if you want to protect your record, you better make sure that you're insistent on each and every one being given. And the court may ask you, well, I gave this, I didn't give your reasonable doubt instruction, I gave this. Why do you think I need yours as well. Or I don't need yours, I don't need two. And a lot of times the court's going to take one that the judges have because that gives them greater protection because it's been reviewed in the past by the Supreme Court and they said this is a fine jury instruction for reasonable doubt. And if they've got one like that, they're not giving yours. Um, and that may be acceptable, but they may well ask, well, what, what is it about yours that you think is different from what I gave or insufficient from what I gave? Um, and the other part of it is here, we're trying to rush you now, right? But listen, it's 2 o'clock, we want to get the jury to get this case, maybe they can get done today. You have any other problems? You know, because, uh, you, you know, you're the one standing there being the jerk. Let's just give them the case. You know, you put too much time, too much effort in, you got to slow it all down, you got to take a step back, and you got to be insistent on your rights. And this is not always easy because everyone's trying to push you and, 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 and get you to just sort of go along. But you're in the wrong business if that's what you want to do. You can do it respect, you must do it respectfully, courteously, politely. But, but at the end of the day, you're an advocate for your client. And you're not in this business to go along to get along. And, and there will be judges. Some will be ruder than others, but there will be judges that are angry, at least will evince anger at you because of your efforts to protect your client's rights. TD looks at me a little cross-eyed crazy. They are, right? They just want to get done the day. You're slowing this thing down. Well, sometimes that's, that's your job, is to make sure that your client's rights are protected. Um, we had one that took a long while to try. It was a fairly complicated case, and then 
The court didn't have a final charging conference, lit into the, to the charge, went on for a couple hours, and then called the lawyers up and said, okay, what did, seriously, virtually this is verbatim, what did I miss? Um, I left the charge at home, so I went by my memory. Um, and it was virtually off the cuff, but it was a fairly complicated case that took many weeks to try. You would think, if you've, if, if you've got this case where it's likely going to be appealed at any rate, that you would have paid a little more attention to making sure that you yourself dotted your I's and crossed your T's since you held the advocates to, to pretty high standard throughout the lengthy trial. Um, but it almost, you know, the way in which it was done, it almost invites problems simply because until you see the charge then in writing, you know, every mistake may not show up with you, but he's now tell, set, telling you, okay, tell me what you want fixed. And so you had a, you should have been paying pretty close, careful attention to this process, and now you've got to go in and tell them um, how to fix it. And if you don't, you're likely waiving your rights to appeal. Um, a lot of judges, because of the concern about appeal, are going to stick to a pretty well-prepared script that the uh, courts have signed off on with respect to various sort of commonplace instructions. And that's the last part of it. In every case, you're going to need some tailored instructions to your case. You know, the, the just sort of the classic uh, auto accident with a red light violation. Well, red light violation is some evidence of negligence, right? Um, but, but I need a case that says that. That may not be in the standard instruction book and the like. So uh, jury instructions, really important. I think we should pay much more attention to it at the beginning of the case. Uh, as we start to think about what information I need, we should be focused on 18 months to two years from now, this case is going to be tried. And this is what the judge is going to tell the jury at that point. Now I need to address that information by way of my discovery and everything else. Anything else on that? Griffin versus GMC is uh, a pain and suffering and uh, a difficult damage case. Um, but this is pretty common in personal injury cases where we've got to figure out how to value um, things that are not always going to be easy to value. And here a significant part of this award uh, is in fact based on uh, pain and suffering. And uh, there's always a problem with trying to figure out exactly what the best method of uh, valuing that is, as well as lost earning capacity um, and the like. The award in Griffin versus GMC uh, on a theory of, ne it was a negligence case. Uh, one, hundred, one million in damages, and judgment has been entered for that amount plus uh, statutory interest, which by the way, uh, cases bear interest as well, both pre-judgment and then post-judgment, depending on when they're paid. Uh, in this case, uh, the uh, defendant argues about certain evidentiary issues, the instructions, saying the award is excessive, um, and the refusal to instruct the jury that an award of damages would be exempt from income taxation. Um, let me just say this on the whole taxation issue, um, because that, that, for the most part, that's been resolved, although it's addressed differently today than it was back when this case came about. Um, I, I firmly believe that to the extent you guys could possibly fit it into your schedule before you graduate, you should take a federal income taxation course here. Um, and you're sitting there with April 15th, never. Um, <laughs> But here's, here's the point. This is a personal injury case that has tax ramifications to it. How we settle it, how we describe the damages, there are tax ramifications to it. One way, it may be tax-free. Another way, it's taxable. At the minimum, you need to know either how to structure the settlement or the advice to give to your client as to what they should do with respect to talking to their CPA and what it's taxable. You know, for instance, a million non-taxable is a lot more money than 800,000 taxable, right? And so the other part of that is it becomes important for you to be able to tell your client 
effectively what what they're likely to see from any settlement. You know, the fact is is that I've more easily been able to settle cases when they recognize that these this award may be completely tax free. I mean that's cash in your pocket at the end of the day. And that's a huge difference for a lot of people than when it's taxable. The rules have changed from this case, Griffin uh, versus GMC, uh, because personal injury cases, depending on how they're structured, some of it may be taxable, some of it may be exempt from taxation, but the rules have changed as to whether it's, it's not all exempt necessarily anymore. Um, the other thing, some of you are going to do family law. So you say, well, what do I need tax for then? There's potential tax ramifications to however you structure that divorce agreement, both from the standpoint of alimony as well as property exchanges and the like. I, I always think, it, for lawyers, you need to know enough so that you don't get yourself in trouble from not knowing. Simply by, you need to know enough when to say, I'm not a tax lawyer, you need to see a CPA or a tax lawyer to get some further advice, maybe before we do anything else, but you need to know enough as to what might bear problems in this area. And a good federal income tax course, and we have, we have a very good teacher here, uh, certainly probably not on your radar about taking it, but well worth taking it when you think, when you can see the different issues that arise here. But that's not really why this case is here for me to give you this little speech. Uh, it's a, it's a gas tank problem, blah, 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 blah. It's a burn case at the end of the day. Um, you, you wouldn't want me to sit on a burn case because I don't even know. I, I would be writing out a big check out of the defendant's pocket because uh, I'm not sure I can look at that objectively, the thoughts of the pain and, and, all, and all the rest of it. Um, but but we got to figure out how to because that, that, that just doesn't seem fair to the defendant. At the end of the day, if it's all based on sympathy, um, that's not a calculation of damages. Um, let's, let's first look at one of the things she'd be entitled to is future earning capacity, right? When we talk about uh, damages in the personal injury context, we talk about general and special damages. Special damages are going to be the uh, out-of-pocket damages for medical expenses and uh, medicines, physical therapy, doctor's bills, you name it. Uh, special damages are oftentimes relatively easy to calculate because we can see what those uh, hard numbers look like. General damages are pain and suffering, future lost wages, future uh, loss of use and enjoyment and the like, um, where they're a little, not a little, they're a lot harder to try and figure out with certainty, except future earning capacity. If someone's disabled and their career is now shortened, there are ways to figure out how much they've lost. If their life expectancy has been shortened as a result of whatever happened to them, then that's relatively easy to calculate what those lost earning years are and the like. Um, so it, it, it is still some precision to it, but obviously some of these have no provision. Uh, 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 precision to them. Uh, this woman uh, actually went back to work at a higher wage than what she was making. Is that right? Yes. Well, I mean, she went back as a secretary job. Yeah. But that's what she was before, right? I didn't see anything higher, but she, she definitely went back to work pretty quick. Yeah, like nine months back. or six months or something like that. Okay, so, so she had, would, uh, under that circumstance, potentially she has no lost wages. She couldn't work from July 70 to March of 71. So that's uh, five and three, eight months. She employed as a legal secretary and has been able to do her work. So, yes, it's about her potential loss right. because of the severity of the damages. You know, she, she may be in such pain that she can't continue this new job that she has. But what evidence is there that she can't continue this job? Uh, she can now. There's evidence by way of this doctor testifying that um, 
45 percent in her left hand and 25 percent in her right right all that dirty in her knee joints and then there was a probability of the development of um, arthritis and that would uh so that's all based on okay but let me just let me go to the first part 45 in her left, 25 in her right, 30 in her knee joints. None of that prevented her from doing the work that she had done prior to this injury. Right? Right. I mean, no one bleeds to General Motors, but, no. but the evidence of future losses, how, the, the actual evidence is, is low, isn't it? We've got an expert saying, this is what her diminution is, but that diminution is not affecting her ability to perform the job at all. And then it says, in his opinion, there's a probability of development of traumatic form of arthritis in some or all of these joints. Any of you ever break a limb? Yes. <laughs> so you know that there is a future possibility of arthritis in that limb. I mean, so that's sort of like a sort of given, isn't it? So she's got these burns, so she's got that as well. I mean, that seems, seems like a relatively commonplace issue, a that probability. Go ahead. That wouldn't have happened if her Buick didn't blow up. Right. Are you satisfied that, that that's going to satisfy a more likely than not standard? And, I, and I'm very sympathetic. I'm going to give her a lot of money, too. I, I'm just looking for the proof that, that I thought we were supposed to get on a more likely than not. Because it says here, this language, the assessment of damages for impairment of earning capacity rests largely on the common knowledge of the jury, sometimes with little aid from evidence, and it cites this Daugherty versus Ruiz case, Cross versus Sharafa. Jeez, that sounds like it's just like guesswork, no? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good with you? Good with you, because we have a sympathetic plaintiff. No? Oh, good with me, but no. As the judge said to counsel, end of that paragraph, I think it is susceptible of common knowledge that with the massive scars that she has, that her future opportunities for employment are going to be impaired. So because she's not pleasant to look at with these scars, she's not going to make as much money. That's what it says, right? No, oh, that is what it says, right? It, it, I, I'm willing. Uh, is that is that's true? It's because he says it's common knowledge. I'm waiting for you, Gary. He says it's common knowledge. All of you people would feel that way. It's common knowledge. People do look different. Like when someone is isn't pleasing to your eye, you don't tend to tend to what? <laughs> We discriminate against them because we don't like the way they look? I'm not saying you discriminate. That's what you are. You are, right? It is what it is, but... Okay, so it is what it is, so it's discrimination, and the judge here is saying, so part of the damages, let's be honest, part of the damages, we don't like to be around people who look like this. And that's going to affect your future employment. It's unfortunate when people are judgmental and people tend to mm -hmm. get a position because you look a certain way or because they like you or like, yeah, it's a, it, it sucks because that's how people are. Okay, but so do you guys, is that a sufficient basis to base a verdict upon? No. The court says it is. I think it is. But this is a Supreme Judicial Court case. This is where it's going to rest. This is going to be the last word on this issue because we say, we saw it before, damages can't be you know, conjecture or speculation. You guys told me about my rosary beads and my two baseball balls, that it can't be sentimental. And now, seriously, this is, this is a sympathetic verdict. I'm sympathetic too, but I, I guess I'm, but that's what this is based on, right? We wouldn't want this to happen to us or one of our loved ones, and we would hope they could get as much money as possible to make their life a little easier, because God knows they're going to handle a lot over the balance of their life. Give them as much money as they can, especially if it's coming from GM, who cares? Well, yeah. no, but Go ahead. This is a little more than that. Is it? Yes, because at least in the language of the judge here, I think he did a nice job articulating when he said in the second to last paragraph, he goes, it's a, if there was evidence of enormous pain and suffering, which will persist over the plane of estimated remaining lifespan. So, I mean, there's that component, like, if, especially in the business world now, if she was a, an accountant in the basement, but if she's a secretary, and, or if she has to interview for a new job in the future, 
she's going to walk into a job interview looking pretty, potentially pretty, depending on how bad she looks, pretty grotesque. And that could hurt her future job interviews, right? So, like, well, in the high tech world, what if she's a booth babe? That's what we used to call them. You get a pretty girl at the booth and, you know, you go to a trade show and, you know, she's not going to be able to do that, right? So there's a job she can't do, right, in business. So, just so I'm clear, my, my legal secretary stands out, sits outside my office, is equivalent to the booth babe, because if she doesn't look good, or he doesn't look good. I'm trying to get sunshine going on there. Uh, I, well, well, but I think that part. So, is this, it is what it is, though? I mean, because we can say, Gary, that is really a politically incorrect <laughs> statement to make, which it is, right? But that's politically incorrect, but he's correct. right. But correct. But he's correct. But he's correct. Yeah. Yeah. They still the call him booth they, they don't do it all? Well, well, it's still called booth bait. You might want to lose that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> I can go you with your point. Show, I can't. You'll hear it still. Trust me. Um, <sighs> so our damage award should account for this discrimination and bias. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. 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 Because she, so I guess the reverse is true then too, right? So since women generally make, what, 75, we'll give you, we'll give you a raise, 75 cents on the dollar for every dollar a man makes, that we should discount your wages when you say, attorneys make X. We say, no, 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 dear. Uh, male attorneys make X. Female attorneys make Y. You get Y. Right? You don't get the average. You, we have to discount, don't we? No. Well, okay, so if, if we're using it here, at least in part, as a basis to say, listen, wink, wink, we all know this woman is going to face serious discrimination, damage, pain, and suffering over her the entirety of her life. And it's not all going to be simply because of the burden. It's going to be the way people treat her. Right. She's going to be a bully. <laughs> I don't know if she's going to get bullied. Uh, you'd have to be pretty creepy to bully someone like this. But not that you don't have to be creepy to bully anyone else. But She's still in the movie. Get out the movie. No, it's the same thing, though. It's the same thing. It's the same thing, so what? It's the same thing. What do you mean, so what? So, so what, though? So A kid might. A kid, a child might. A child that's like, still in school, like a, a, an elementary school kid. But if, but, if, but if it's just the same case and a, and a child comes into the courtroom all burned up, that kid could get, is going to get bullied in, in school. I agree, yes. Know? But so can adults. Adults can get bull bullied as well. That's true. It doesn't, it's not true. just kid related. It's yeah. adults. Uh, ooh, we don't even want to go there with me. Really <laughs> okay, but this yeah, is like all, bullied. we're saying, we're all bringing sort of uh, private experiences in and saying, she doesn't need to have to put proof of all this in because we all accept it. No, that, that is what we're saying, right? That's what he said. But I thought this was supposed to be evidence and all the rest of it. And this judge, and I don't, I frankly don't object to the amount. But this doesn't really seem like a sufficient basis to get us to where we need to be. They, they talk about a couple other things just to point out, just to, for you to think about discount to present value, right? If we're awarding future damages for years 30 to 70, then, then there's got to somehow account for this issue of, if you're telling me your damages in, uh, when you're at age 70, uh, just to make the math easier, $10,000, and that's part of your damage model here, well, you're only 35, if I give you that money today, you shouldn't get a full 10 grand. There should be some discount for future losses because I'm giving you at age 35, if I give you at age 35 $10,000, that's equivalent to probably 15,000 by the time you get to year 70. So either we have to not give interest on the, the amount or we have to discount those losses to present day value. You're looking at me puzzled. I don't get a discount, why? Because, okay, if you tell me, let's just yes. make it simple. You lost a dollar today. I give you a dollar, you're whole. Okay? If you tell me 25 years from now, I'm going to lose a dollar, and I give you that dollar today, you're going to have a lot more than one dollar in 25 years from now. 
I should probably only have to give you a quarter. Because if I give her a quarter today, that may well be the equivalent to a dollar 25 years from now. But doesn't inflation offset that? Well, th that's, that's the question. The that's right. So, right. But, but it depends on whether we're using inflation-adjusted figures or not. If you're telling me her medical expense in year at age 70 is $10,000, if that's an inflation adjusted figure or not, depends on whether we need to discount it. Because again, your damages, if you're saying we're expecting them to be 10 based on today's dollars, then we're okay. You can get 10, you can put 10 right into the damage. But if you're saying it's 10 based on what the cost of inflation will be for the, the MRI 10, 25 years from now, well then if, I give, if you're getting that money today, there's an argument about the discounting to present value. You know, that's this whole notion of sometimes we will pay out settlements in the form of annuities and the like instead because, and that's another way to, to think about starting to structure a settlement. Client wants a million dollars. They're set on a figure of a million bucks. Kelly's not going to pay you a million dollars today to settle this case. What if I can get you a million paid out over five years? A million out over five years, probably, well, you know, the interest rates aren't so hot anymore. Probably could be north of 800,000. We'll just say make to make the argument simpler. A payout over five years of a million, present day value is 800 grand. You know how, you, you guys play the lottery, don't you? <laughs> you, can either take, you can either take your payout over 20 years and get the full 100 million, or you can get the actual cash value today, which is probably, 65 million and you see you right you see that that the options that's what we're doing under some of these scenarios and that's what they're that's the question is do they get it and you're right here in this case the court says you don't need to do that under these circumstances and then they talk about this income tax aspect of it and that that frankly is the jury's not going to hear about that the change has been different at any rate and if you got you guys are going to be doing this type of cases you need to know what the language is as to what's covered what is taxable and what isn't taxable um, you guys already talked about the pain and suffering um, and that was really let's see yeah let's just look at page 371 quickly um, the defendants are arguing these damages here are uh, excessive the plaintiff says the injuries were unquestionably severe which none of us agree with uh, but then they say listen they the award here is greatly disproportionate to the injuries proven such that they represent a miscarriage. Um, and so the court should have ordered a remitter, which is a reduction in the amount of damages awarded, or a new trial. Uh, the medical expenses, and these are called, these would be the specials, right? Medical expenses are 25,000, basically. Wage loss is only 5,200. The actual wage loss is only 5,200. That's what's kind of odd about saying we've got significant future lost wages because we, we doesn't really show, at least by the, the economics don't show it. So we've got really a total of $30,000 in specials and we've got a general verdict of a million which reflects loss of future use and enjoyment, loss of earning capacity and uh, pain and suffering. And then what they, 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 they said, and this is the language one of you already quoted me, um, there was evidence to support a finding that it would, there would be substantial loss of earning capacity in the future. Respectfully, I think it's a little scant, but there is expert testimony on that that you quoted me. Uh, but then they, they fall back on this. More importantly, there was evidence of enormous pain and suffering which will persist over the plaintiff's estimated remaining lifespan of some 43 years. Establishing the remainder of the lifespan is relatively straightforward. There's social security tables and things that we can establish that through. Compounded by permanent loss of bodily functions and then the massive scarring and disfigurement. Uh, and again, scarring and disfigurement are compensable uh, uh, awards. The question is how do we um, establish a dollar value for um, those uh, awards. 
Um, let's look at uh, Professor Sullivan's favorite uh, issue, uh, Krasnex, Krasnecki versus Meffin, uh, which is another mass case, uh, awarding damages for the loss of your companion. Um, any of you have a favorite pet? No? No pet people? Hello? I do. What do you got? I have a chitsu, um, chubby. A good Shih Tzu, because my mother had a bad one. Um, <laughs> he is the nicest dog ever. He's a cute dog. Okay, what else do we have in the room? I have pets, I just didn't say they were my favorites. Oh, they're not, you have pets, but they're not that... that. What do you got, Pat? I have a dog. What kind? She, she's, a, she's a mutt. She's a... Oh, good. She's good. Works she's for good me. Dog. 50 pounds. Anyone else? <laughs> I have two small dogs, two uh, miniature schnauzers. One is not very friendly. He's old, too. 16, north of 16 at this point. Uh, and the other is uh, three years old, or maybe two and a half now. Um, and he will uh, crawl up and uh, when you're watching TV and either sleeps on your lap or in the ottoman. Uh, and seriously, ever since we went and got him, he uh, he was like jumping out of the thing when we got there. You knew he, he picked us more than we picked him. Um, and he gets he's, he gets really uh, uh, lonely if we're either my son, it's, it's his dog actually, but he's with me as much as he's with Jerry, if uh, one of us is not home. Um, if something should happen to Scout, that's his name, he's white, and it's just not, it's a really pretty dog too. Uh, something should happen to Scout. What do I get? Kelly, Kelly stole Scout. You know, one of our dogs was stolen one time. <laughs> they, they, they just, so the gas guy stole him. He was outside. Yep, we did. We found him, though. Oh. It wasn't pretty. Oh, it was street shot us. Shot us? Oh, yes. What? My dog ate her cat. Oh, oh, what? She shot He ate it completely or just bit her? No, oh, he ate it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you watch it happen? No, I didn't watch that. No, no did the woman see it? Is that why she the shot him? Did. The what? Kids did. The kids? Was it in Oh my god, Sandy. City? No. <laughs> it's, better than, it's better than anything I could come up with. <laughs> okay, so wait a minute, so let's talk about this. What kind of dog was it? A shepherd. Oh. oh, man. We owned a shepherd when I was little, too. Yes. Chucky, my mother said, went to the farm, but I laid away. <laughs> 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 I saw my aunt a number of years ago, distant aunt, I said, so how's Chucky? She looked at me, Chucky. <laughs> <laughs> Chucky. Chucky, Chucky, that, that German Chucky. I said, <laughs> my. <laughs> my. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about your dog. Some of them are nicer than others. Um, and how did you get the lost bull? <laughs> <laughs> I believe my sainted mother, okay? Aren't we all supposed to? Uh, <laughs> Professor Sullivan, as you might guess, greatly attached to her two dogs. What are they worth? Something should happen to them. They're worth more than sheep, I know that. What's it, well, what does that mean? Uh, like more than sheep means what? You spend more time with your dog. You're, yep. I mean, maybe well, this guy spent an inordinate amount of time I with know. the sheep, though, frankly, right? Sheep, sheep are well. I don't think sheep's a farm animal. I don't think it's a companion. That's well, possible. but for these oh. for these people, they were though, no? Yes. Okay, let's stick with the dogs. But Krasnecki versus Meffin, they had the run of the house, right? Some people have pigs in the house, right? Little oh. pigs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's gross. <laughs> well, but for I have two fish, an iguana, and a little Yorkshire Terrier. And I like my Yorkshire Terrier, but she's bossy. And I, she's more bossy than me, so that's she's why. She's a diva. Mm. She's a diva. You competition. You like but that. she does do one thing right. If I let her out, because I don't like to walk her. I don't like to walk her, and the girls don't walk her. Well, I have to force my girls. Don't walk her in Sandy's neighborhood. But I let her out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And she'll go for a walk, and then she comes back, and I give her a treat, and I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> well, let me ask this. Let's use Sandy's example. <laughs> Sandy wants to sue her neighbor. <laughs> What'd she get? What would she get? Sandy was very close to her German Shepherd. That was 
it's true. Oh yeah, what was the dog's name? Shep. Shep, <laughs> how original. Yeah, original. Okay, Sandy was very close to Shep. <laughs> she might neighbor pulls out the gun, <laughs> shoots the dog. That's, then those oh, are the facts. Terrible. Those are the facts. Yeah. How much can how much Sandy get for the dog? How old was it? How old was Shep? In, in ten. Ten yeah. when she shot him. Yes. Okay. So what'd she get? Huh? <laughs> okay, but just you you've got a case, you've got Kresnecki. Right. Yeah, that one's not good because <laughs> Because you don't like the result. Yeah. So but, I'm going to use this one. Gonna... Well, but this is this is the Supreme Judicial Court, 2002. You may not like the case, but I don't think you're going to find a more recent one on it um, in Massachusetts, at least. How much does Sandy get for Shep? Well, the other thing about this case is that different is, is I think that <clears throat> the, the plaintiff used bad strategy or the plaintiff's lawyer. I think it was the plaintiff that tried to push or didn't cooperate when they, they could have put in a, a, a value of replacement value or market value for the sheet. They decided to nix that. So they really weren't that cooperative. So this this that makes us a little outlier on that, I think. So I don't know. Well hold on though. So even if they had amended, they could have got market value. If That's they wanted to plead that. Yeah, so well so what's so what does that mean? Cindy gets market value. Well for then plus like like Sunshine said. But you got to then you really could have to make a better argument. It's a farm animal versus a domestic companion animal, I guess what they call it here. So you'd have to try to make that differentiation. Whether it's other cases to look at to do that, um, to develop some emotional attachment to your pet, I guess. So then then you get emotional pain and suffering somewhere in there. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Where did you guys get all that from this case? Because let's just I mean, if so, if these were not. Sheep, but dogs, the result would be different, or you just want it to be different? Because I'm willing to accept in Krasnecki that these sheep were companion animals. Um, look, at the, look at the language here in the factual background. The plaintiffs argue that the term companion an animal is not limited to cats and dogs, and that evidence at the motion hearing established that the slain sheep were pets and companion animals to them. The evidence indicates that the plaintiffs regarded the sheep as their babies and spent six to seven hours a day with them, far more than Sandy spends with Shep, giving, giving them names and celebrating their birthdays with special food and balloons. You don't think they exactly... They patted... Do you really think... I don't think so. They patted, hugged, and brushed the sheep and baked snacks for them. <laughs> when the sheep were young, the plaintiffs welcomed them into the home for up to four weeks at a time, bottle fed them, and allowed them to run through their home. And the plaint evidence also indicates the plaintiffs suffered significant emotional distress and related physical problems. I, I think all that's true. I mean, if this is what you did, and you don't even want to amend your complaint, I guess I think they were really incredibly attached to the sheep. Really? Yeah. I, I do. Okay, but listen, does it matter is what I'm asking. You were, I'll give you, you were incredibly attached to Shep. I'm incredibly attached to Scout. So what? So what? It's a, if, if something happens to it, isn't the court saying that's equivalent to you losing your microphone, your recording device? I thought animals were considered property. Which means? Like you can't. Say, it's not like it's your child. It's more like, um, yeah. like, like you said, they're recorders. Of that's what. Like. Go get another. That's go get another German chef. Right? Yeah. Sandy gets another German chef. That's it. I'm not saying, but I'm thinking that's what I've always been taught. Like, well, what does the, the case say? The said Sandy gets another German chef. Mm. Depreciated because this one's ten years old. She gets a used German chef. Used one, yeah. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> The woman shot her dog, and that's all she gets. She gets a nine-year-old one. A, ni a nine-year-old German Shepherd who, who has a, an affinity for cats. A less healthy. But th th that's it? No emotional distress? Nothing else? Based on this case only. Okay, but this case only is a Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court case where most of you will be practicing law, right? And if Massachusetts doesn't recognize it, I don't think the great state of New Hampshire is going to be any more liberal on giving you 
emotional distress damages for your companion animals or man. Right? I thought I saw something somewhere. Well, but I mean, you, you look at the case. They want loss of consortium. <laughs> well, the companion. I know. No. Oh, okay, but 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 see, is it easy? Is it that what you're doing? It's because it's easier because it's cheap. So it's someone's dog. My my mother, as she was dying, had this shit so called precious, misnamed precious, precious. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and precious was a biter. Okay, but to her. This was her companion, and she was sick, and then Precious was always there, so as long as she was alive, that dog was going to be with her, despite he would bite my kids, he would bite anyone. What'd you do to it? Huh? What'd you do to it? I didn't do anything with it. I didn't do anything with it. I walked him in your neighborhood. No. The tree, you're there. <laughs> no, but but right. And listen, and, and, uh, and all kidding aside, with I like my other dog, Scout. I, I will tell you, my son would be hot, uh, more than heartbroken. If some, when something happens to that dog, it's going to be. And he's 25 years old. He's not little. It's going to be really bad news. I would be heartbroken. Sandy, I'm sure, must have devastated. Devastated by Shep. Yes, yes. But that it it, it, it it doesn't matter. Is, is that right? According to this you get, you get, it's property, she says. It's property, and you can make all the damage, all the arguments like they tried here. Because I did think, she, they were saying, okay, let's accept the notion that it could be a companion animal. It just, it's not to our liking, but to them, it is. And by the way, I think some people, my guess, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a horse person, I grew up in the city, but for those people attached to their horses, that, 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 it may be even a greater bond than some of us have for our smaller companion animals. So um, I'm not so sure we should be cutting it off where, where we think, you know, oh, it's dogs and cats and nothing else. Because I think they're accepting the notion, okay, let's say it's a companion animal. But no emotional distress, no other items. You don't even get, really, a whole dog back. All right? If, if a new German Shepherd is, I don't know what they go for now, say a thousand bucks, and the useful lifespan is 15 years, then we're looking at, you've got a third left, we're going to give you 300 bucks, send you on your way. And Pat, this is so wrong. Pat gets nothing, right? Pat gets to go down to the pound and pick out another month. No. <laughs> Why would they do that? That's just wrong. Well, what's what's just wrong? Because that that's the question. That's the question, and this this is the state of the law in most jurisdictions. What's just wrong about it? Again, I agree with Gary. This is sheep. What was it? One no, no, but, but okay, but listen. But if it's a dog, it's a okay, okay, it's listen, dog. listen. Sandy's situation. Oh. Say what a horse. Sandy's situation is more like she could have filed like a criminal case, right? Oh yes. And she could have sought for like punitive damages. No, okay, listen. Suppose she can file a criminal case. That's not going to change their civil case damages. Okay? I, that's why I think okay, her example is a great one. The woman shoots her dog. Yeah. Okay? I think you guys are getting tied up here that it's sheep, and we don't, none of us are obviously country people attached to their sheep. Okay? But don't go, not my, not my little Shih Tzu, right? Hello, oh, not, not, not Shep. Um, I think the court got passed. I think they're willing to accept in this case. Let's call it a companion animal. Even if it is, where do we stand? And so, aren't they saying that companion animal, no matter what, Sandy's not getting emotional distress, she's not getting other non-economic damages, and if she wants damages, she gets market value of a 10-year-old dog, and then even more importantly, let's take a look at Pat. Pat's got a mutt, he said. That's what I'm saying. I think this is wrong. 
Well, but when you say you think it's wrong, is you, you mean I object to what the case says the law is, yes. but recognize that's the law. Yes. Because because that that's the problem here. You're saying, well, I think if it were my dog, it would be different. The answer is no, it would not, right? Because this case says no, it would not. Right. If it's a companion, listen, they, in so one way, shoots his dog and he gets nothing. Not even a dog replace them. Did you get anything? No, I, I was going to replace the replacement no. cost. I mean, she cost me money to adopt the dog. dog. Innocent walk away with it. Well, what? Well, what does it cost to adopt a dog? Yep. Fifty bucks. Oh boy. Hundred bucks. It's a hundred now to adopt. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably a couple hundred bucks or something. A couple hundred bucks to adopt a mutt. Yeah. Is it really? I think so. Yeah. Okay, you get, you get a yeah. How old was your How old's your mutt? Six months when I got it. She's like four now. Do you want to be sad about this? So yeah. it's whatever the fee would be, and that may be it. Gotta get a spade new. Spade new. Oh, so you want your spade? Okay, Pat says, so I want the adoption fee, and I want the spade or neutered fee. Any other start of things? What if we got to get a crate? Food. A crate? Food. Well, you didn't have a crate before, then. That's like a bad yeah, one. This we're dog might not chew through the thing and bleed all over the place. <laughs> oh, I, oh, wait a minute, though. So you, don't, you didn't have didn't a crate because it wasn't a puppy? I didn't have a crate for the first one, but I might need one for this one. Yeah, my first kid didn't go to college, but this kid's gonna now. It's on your dime. No, I don't think so. You, you don't. Uh -huh. You don't get more, do you? But Pat, what about training classes? Yeah. If your dog was trained, my dog is trained, so yeah. Yeah. It's your dog, dog wasn't shot. Sandy doesn't appear to be trained. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry for you, Pat. You know, one thing I saw here that was wrong, though. <laughs> now leading to this was so killing. I, I I think it's. Just what about cats? Food? Cats must be worthless because they stay. <laughs> I'm not, I haven't met a cat. I'm not a cat. Because they have about nine at a time, right? I always, always a sign for free kittens. <laughs> <laughs> no, so cats are the reason, but cats can't be worthless. <laughs> you don't breed cats. They breed free kittens. Yeah, no, so is that right though? So your no. cat, now because we, we're saying we can create a small damage model for our dogs. Cats? <coughs> is that no, the, no, the cat has your cat. I think it's Listen, a you're, I'm not paying you for the attachment to your cat though, aren't I? I'm paying you what the Gary said. They refused, they did not want, they were trying to make a legal point. We don't want market value. If we can't have our, our incidental and consequential damages from our loss, we're not going to accept simply market value approach to our, as they see it, their loved ones. So now you're saying, well, my cat is my loved one. Listen, Professor Rudnick loves her cats. Okay, loves her cats. But if I go in and strangle one, <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> right in front of her. No, right in front of her. Right, no, no, really, right, right in that, front of her. Right in front of her that should be some emotional stress. stress. And that's well, what okay, but wait a minute. So let's talk about that because the case does talk about people, that. People. Right, right. In front. <laughs> so it, why right in front of her? Why would that make a difference? Because that's some of the uh, about two years back, people walking their dogs in Charlestown. They would step on a, a, a hot. A hot, a hot cell from Boston Edison on the sidewalk, and the dog expired because the, the, the sidewalk was uh, uh, electric, uh, grit, and it hit something and, and died. And then, the, and the, you know, you're walking your dog, and you see your dog die right in front of you, huh? Oh my God! That's part of this. So, so wait a minute, though. So you're making a distinction. If, I, like, if I did that right in front of Professor Rudnick, then she might have her own emotional distress damages. Is that correct? I, Where did you get that from, by the way? Well, is it in here? Just about three. I, but this is what I was arguing. Maybe I'm totally off. But no, here, that's a terrible way to, to, to argue. <laughs> Maybe I'm totally off. But yeah, here it goes. <laughs> well, here it said it was reasonably foreseeable that the plaintiff would suffer emotional distress upon learning of the slaughter of the sheep. And there was seven. And seeing their bodies. So could you imagine seeing seven bodies laying around? But then, th this is where I argue. Where are you reading from? Just above number three, Thank just above. Okay. Number three where it says last. Oh, okay, right, 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 right above three. It says, right, I've got it now. In the circumstances, my my page here is 577, but I don't know whether that's the original. Yeah, 577. Okay. Sometimes your pages are on and sometimes they're not. Okay, but wait a minute, you, you stopped reading. Yeah, and, but then and, and it said, you, however, the plaintiff. However, right. This is what I don't like. Okay. The plaintiff's greater rights than would be recognized in the case of a person who suffers emotional distress 
as a result of tortuously caused death of a member of his immediate family. So basically what they're saying is that the, they can have emotional uh, distress from seeing their, their sheep. Seeing the end bodies. result. Yeah, the end result, as opposed to you seeing the end result of your immediate mem family member. It's the next sentence, I think, is where they explain that? The next sentence. The next yeah. You're right. The next sentence, and this is the distinction, right? This gets us, I assume you guys did this in tort, sort of the zone of danger, right? Yeah. And, and that is the point where it gets into, and that's why you said if she was present when I strangled and killed her cat in front of her, now she's in a zone of danger where she can argue her emotional distress. It has been explained in such a case that limiting liability on the basis of admittedly arbitrary factors, such as presence, or temporal proximity must be employed for policy reasons to prevent an unreasonable expansion of liability for the multitude of injuries that could fall within the bare principles of reasonable foreseeability. And, and so that, that is what we're talking about, and I think your, your distinction is quite correct, is that if I do that to her cat in front of her, she has a claim against me for that infliction of emotional distress and her emotional damages. If, on the other hand, she comes home, just like these folks did, and sees her cat dead on the rug, uh, and it was a result of my hand, she gets whatever the damages would be for the market value of that cat. And, and again, I think it's easier when we start to think about establishing a market value for a dog, uh, market value for a horse, um, it not, not for, I mean, I think, Again, maybe this is my unfamiliarity with it, but I see ads all the time for free cats. Um, so maybe it's the cost of spaying it, as Pat said. Um, but I think beyond that, you, don't, you, you, you may be out of luck. I but I also too. think that there should be something for seeing their bodies. Like, if but your wait, wait, dog okay, was shot, stop. if you... Where are you getting that? I, not, it, it's okay to think it, but I need you to know what the law is. Too. I know. But, but here's the thing. We need to change, <laughs> we need to change, change the law then because they're going to be inflicted. They're going to be emotionally disturbed at seeing the dead bodies lying around. Good if you life. do not come into contact with your animal and he died, then all that's sad. But if you actually see them there, and so right here they're saying it, what if you actually see it killed in front of you? Do you ever know anyone really attached to their motor vehicle? <laughs> no, sir. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah, some big curly guy. I don't know. No, I am. Oh, you are? I, I am. I love my car. I love it. You're attached to your van. Oh, she loves Midnight. Her oh, car is named. Oh, good. Oh, oh, it's, it's enough whack jobs in this room to go around. <laughs> 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 Fun group. Uh, <laughs> a good bag of crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so <laughs> I'm the leader of the circus. <laughs> okay, so wait a minute though. So, so should she get damages when someone plows into midnight? That's not a life though. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I don't that, want to piss Kelly off, but that's not a life. I mean, but I, I am attached to my car. I love my car. You know, I. I do everything for it. So she loves her dog the same amount you give her, her, her for dog her dog. It's a breathing thing. Life. It's <clears throat> a stupid property. It's her fish. What? Her fish. It's the same thing. If you're tired Is it really her cash. fish? I'm She's going to give her, you're going to give her emotional distress damages for fish. <laughs> Something she can never touch other than look at and watch them go. And I, I love my fish. But watch them go back and forth where she, she has a real relationship with Midnight. She gets to touch it and caress it. She washes it. She takes care of it. I know. Washes it. She takes care of it. They sing together. Oh my God. Do you not think she sings in the car? Are you kidding me? Do you not know her? <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> the only question is how much does she dance with Midnight? Okay. <laughs> but there's no doubt she does. And so again, that's a better example. So, but her car, she can't. No matter how attached she is. But no. her cat, yeah. Her dog, yeah. But that's not what the law says. Her, the law says those things, those things, her car, Shep, Scout, they're no different. They're all fall, and my little tape recorder here, they all fall into the same group of, group category of items, and that's it. I think but, that's fair. But Peter said we can't fish anymore because it hurts the fish. So. Aye, aye, aye. So, 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 so 
So is that so? But that's so. That's the law. To think that we are, I mean, not for nothing. We were young when my dog got shot. So the four, my, me and my three sisters come out. We see the dog shot in the head. I mean, come on. We didn't get anything. We should have. Well, what, 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 when you say we should have, how do you figure? Because how is that different than these folks coming to see the dog, the the the, the uh, sheep ravaged like this? And that's why it's wrong. That's why. What did it happen though? It was like. In a residential neighborhood? Yes. Well, where did you live at the time? Webster, Mass. Okay, okay. I grew up in Dorchester. Okay, Webster, Mass is not like <laughs> well, that's a <laughs> nice That's a farm to me. I grew up in Summerhill until I was fourteen. Okay, so okay, so then we both know it what the city's farm. like. Webster's a farm. Yes. It, it, I've seen this before in farming areas. If your dog's free, they're going to shoot them right. because they're concerned about chickens and and yes. other well other livestock and the like. Would it have made you feel better if you just pressed charges for them? I'm not sure there's any charges. I think if, if was the dog on her property, yes. I think I could shoot. I think the uh, listen. Yeah. I know yeah. it sounds. If it's on their property. I mean, if she walked the dog down, walked down to your house and shot it, then well, let me no, tell. She walked the dead dog back down to our house, though. How'd she walk the dog? Oh. <laughs> how'd how did she walk? Leash? They didn't walk. They did with a, a rope. She actually brought it down. Drag. Oh. And put it in our front lawn. She's sick. Oh my God. So you want to wow. that no, seriously. Yeah. She's a sick lady. <laughs> she is. That's, that's, that's serious. That's serious. 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 I called everybody. Oh, now see that. Now that. Yes. That. See now even still with that, but it still raises an interesting point. So they didn't see the dog killed, but now she takes that. And brings it down. Drags it down the street. Nothing happened to her. Nothing happened to this woman. Nothing. Nothing happened. Can we pass the session? Well, wait a minute. You know, we don't have to look that far. Isn't? Didn't nothing happen here either? With the dog? With the actual dog? Was it the dog or the fox? That it was a dog, right? Yeah. Where? Two dogs. Two dogs in the beginning. Right. Nowadays they'd shoot them. The dogs. Don't you think? Your dog. Only if it killed a right, person. My dog. Yeah. Killed no, a only if a dog right. attacked. Like there was a story that a, a dog bit a little girl. A baby. A yeah. baby. Yes. Nine, nine, face. nine years old. I saw that. But that was, well, they put that dog yeah. to sleep now. No, yeah, no. They voted on that. They no. voted on that. They had to. The the county. That was an older case. This <clears throat> newer case last night. That was different. I think the child jumped on the dog's rope or something and scared the dog. Oh, that's so. a new case then. I didn't yeah, hear that. That, that. that one last night was, I think, a little different. They would kill my dog. Oh, the there was something one, from earlier. Yeah, the earlier one. Weeks ago. This dog attacked more than once. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you have some articles here that you should review as well. Uh, it talks about proving partial loss of earning capacity. See, a lot of times people, they don't fully recover, and so they're going to have a loss of earnings in the future, or there'll be a period of time for which they still can't return to full work, uh, but can return for a portion of it. Uh, and so they, there were times where we have to prove partial loss. Um, I like the article on 10 mistakes of justice see attorneys make. Um, and you know, you can't value it prematurely, and you don't have to drop just because someone makes you a counter offer. I think you should look at these things, and I think there's a lot of good information, especially for newer attorneys. And one of the more important ones to me is this, you know, not seeking a colleague's advice. Get a reality check. Talk to people. I still do that with some cases. Uh, and sometimes I'll bring cases to you guys and give you some information to see what you'd come back with. It's, it's helpful uh, to be able to, to start to think about it as others would as you start to try and figure out uh, what something might be worth. And especially when you start to think about the article here is on explaining pain how you do it, who can help. I mean, a lot of that comes down to, at some point, a narrative. I mean, you've got to make your client's story understandable for people so that they can get a feel for how much pain that person's in. And to the extent that you can have those words properly and adequately show uh, what that's, that loss is, uh, you know, that's the way you're more likely going to have to do it because many jurisdictions don't allow uh, uh, a per diem approach to uh, awards of pain and suffering. And then the article on recovery for loss of enjoyment in life. Um, you know, we tend to accept the idea that you've lost uh, wages, which is usually pretty easy to determine. 
Um, we tend to accept even that you can prove loss of future earnings, uh, as we saw in the GMC case where we said you has got 45% disability here, 30 here, and another 20% over time. Uh, that will take its toll even though it's not presently showing. But those are not the only damages we're entitled to because you also have what we call loss of enjoyment of life. You know, we, we work to live, we don't live to work. There are things we do that we're deprived of when someone uh, violates our rights and runs us over with the vehicle or does some other type of uh, action that, that means we have personal injuries. Um, but we don't just get our lost wages. Uh, if your arm is broken in the auto accident, you can no longer play catch with your son. That's worth something. If you enjoy skiing um, and you can't ski for that season, it's not just the season pass you paid for that you're out of pocket, but it's maybe the dozen or 15 times that you would have skied that you're now entitled to get. Maybe I'd, I'd give you 100 bucks for each lost ski trip. Uh, 35 times. 35, okay. Well, whatever it is, um, that's the loss of enjoyment of life. And you've got to think about that because we don't always, and people don't always readily accept it, but it's other things you do in addition to working that, that make your life enjoyable that you're also, you're entitled to be put back in the position you would have been but for the damage done to you. And then the last article in the package here is uh, just uh, for you to start to think about again, sort of the gender bias in damage awards. And it's not just obviously limited to gender bias, uh, but there are uh, biases attendant with any damage award. And we do tend to play on the jury's um, general understanding and stereotypes and all the rest of it. And I think it's legitimate to ask, so is that just the way we work? Um, you know, if we've got a little girl injured, we had one of these one time, so you put her in the little patent leather shoes and the small white socks so that you can see the uh, scar shown on her from her ankle to just below her knee. Um, no sense wearing dark tights to cover that up. Uh, if that's what we're seeking compensation for. Uh, so, so that is the nature of what we do here. We, we play on the, the bias and favoritism that people have because just by putting them in the jury box, you don't eliminate that. And to some extent, obviously, you as the advocate are going to recognize that and perhaps take advantage of it, um, hopefully within reason. Uh, but I think that's an interesting uh, article as well for you to read and think about as you start to advocate for damages and the like. So I will see you next week. And let's all say a little prayer for poor Shep. <laughs>